Yo! 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 <laughs> I wasn't even watching the countdown. <laughs> welcome, Hi, welcome. This is Alberto, sequel BI. <laughs> I'm trying to. So we, we, um, ciao friends. <laughs> this is sequel BI channel. But today we are, uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, Adam Saxton and Patrick LeBlanc. Uh, from Gynacube because we want to talk about uh, what can uh, what are the common issues in large data in Power BI and maybe analysis services. Alberto, present yourself. Alberto is Hi, I'm Alberto. <laughs> Alberto Ferrari, SQL BI. I work with Marco. I do all stuff about DAX. Um, yeah. yeah, that's it about and me. Just for the very few people who don't know uh, Adam and Patrick. Uh, Adam and Patrick, do you want to introduce yourself uh, very, very quickly? So, uh, uh, Adam Saxon, just a guy in a cube doing the work. We have a All small right. YouTube channel where we do videos and, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, working with large enterprise customers in our day job. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, we're going to try and bring that to bear on this stream. Yeah. Patrick LeBlanc, what that guy said. With that guy, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, work to me. Yeah, yes. we, we split the screen this way. You know, I think this is the worst question you can ever ask to a geek present yeah. yourself or introduce yes. yourself. I mean, yes, I present I me. I know, I know. So, so, let me just introduce the format. So, we are live on different channels. So, we have YouTube, LinkedIn, the channels where we have the larger number of people, and Twitch and Facebook. Now we can see the questions from everybody. Uh, we already, we, the idea of this session is to discuss about the common issues that we can find in large data models. And we would ask to Patrick and Adam, we would ask them uh, questions. I, Alberto and I, we have questions and probably they would ask something to us too, but I would, and we will take a look at the questions coming from the several feeds and we will try to answer online. So we may not be able to answer it into the chat, but we will try to answer directly. Mark, Marco, one suggestion yeah. also, uh, as uh, at least on the YouTube side, uh, the chat is very lively, um, as I normally expect. Um, and I would recommend, I do see Alex Powers in the chat. If yep. you want to, you know, borrow yep. a feature from the guy in a cube live stream, you may be able to take advantage of Hey Alex if you make him a moderator and he can <laughs> <Okay>. drop links. <laughs> okay. Just a suggestion. Okay, okay. Uh, just a second. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, uh what it's, is it? The... It's it's about it's about the cell or it's all about the cell. Alex, say something in the chat. So you yeah, can grab I, you. I, I don't have the YouTube link here, so I I'm uh, right. I, I just I yeah. distracted. I distracted. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> okay. All right. That's fine. So let's start. <laughs> yes. And we we have actually we made a detailed plan about what to say. And I think the first question was uh, uh, what do Adam we say? Patrick. What are the big? What is the more important? Uh, problem, the, the more common problem you see in large data models, models that have uh, billions of rows. What, what do you think is a large data model first? Oh. Uh, what do you think, Patrick? 10,000 rows? <laughs> no. One, no. One million rows. Yes. No, 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 no. I can't. I can't. Billions, 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 yeah, billions. billions of rows. Yeah, uh, billions of rows. I, what, what gets me is when customers call up and they're like, oh, you know, we're, we're trying to work with large scale of data. We're struggling with size of the model. You know, we've got a P3 or a really large analysis services and we've got 300 million rows. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, there, we, we can help you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's data modeling, Marco. I think yep. for me, it's just people don't understand that you need to have a, you know, a curated data model. Adam and I, we work with cust big customers all the time. And like he said, some people will come and they have this 100 million rows and they go, we can't get this in the memory. But then we work with customers that have billions of rows, but they get it into memory because their fact tables are, I, I like to say they're skinny. You know, their fact tables are really narrow, but they've done a good job at design the data model. And, and that is probably the number one thing 
that we see. And just one more thing, one more thing. Another thing is that people always think they need all the data. So when we talk about, hey, you only need to pull in a certain certain amounts of data, people always think about columns. They think about columns. Oh, I don't need this column. I don't need that column. But it's a horizontal you know, slice that they also need to look at from, especially from a time perspective, people think, oh, I need 30 years worth of data. Nobody's going to look at 30 years worth of data, my friend. Nobody's <laughs> going to look at that. You only need about five years. Okay. There you go, Marco. The, 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 as an example, uh, there is a customer I'm working with where they've got uh, a model where they were able to get it up to 4 billion rows imported on a P2 in premium P2. Uh, and the model size was about 15 gig. Uh, of note, their fact it was a very clean model, so keep it clean, keep it simple. Their fact table only had about twelve columns, and they were all numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. this raises to me another question because I mean, it's totally clear that uh, most of the times it's the data model. Yeah. But the natural question is, why is the data model? So is that the developers do not know data modeling? They didn't study Kimball or they want to try something different, or is it the business that do not ask uh, the proper questions? Yes. Because it's so yeah. common that there should be a common, a root cause on, yes. top of, yeah. Uh, yeah. on top of that. You know, Albert, I learned something this week that I did not know. Other BI tools that are not like Power BI, <laughs> they actually encourage you to use these flat tables with, you know, and you don't have to worry about cardinality. But what I also learned is they run into the same performance problems, you know? And so I, I agree that maybe people don't know, maybe people don't know these skills, but sometimes you got to blame the technologies because, I mean, you become a product of what you use a lot of times, like Excel. Think about Excel. Excel, hell. Everybody uses Excel. I, I remember Marco saying Excel is the best data entry tool. Right. And so everybody's using Excel everywhere. So we have all these silos that the people on this panel right here, we got to go figure out how to consolidate those silos. And I think that it's not that they don't know them. Right. It's just nobody. They never had to learn it. They never had. They, ne they were never posed with these problems. And now Power BI is just everywhere. Power BI is all over the world. People are downloading, using it. And now the data is scaling. And now they got to learn just like, you know, they got to learn this new this new way of doing things. The other thing I'll add to that, though, too, is that it's not just the BI tools, though. Some of the larger, some of the data sources that you commonly see with big data. So if I think of Hadoop, if, I, if I'm thinking of Redshift, if I'm thinking of, you know, some NoSQL implementation, a lot of those are more of that large single table structure where it's not broken out. And then to put Power BI on top of that to use a star schema of some sorts, it's... it's Typically, what I see is the skill sets aren't there to necessarily accomplish it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. To me, what I find strange in this discussion is that you imagine uh, that a large company has a team to create data marts, data warehouses. They know everything about Kimball, dimensional modeling, and it it always surprises me when when I see when I see this happens because. Uh, <clears throat> Basically, you, you find a company that probably has a data warehouse within the company, but then they try to do analysis, ignoring what they already have or the experience they had accumulated over the years. Is, is this something that you find yes. in the companies too or not? Sometimes. So yeah. there's, there's other aspects too that we see um, where uh, depending on the ownership of the data. So like some teams, look, I just own the infrastructure and we're letting the business own the data. I actually am not, I own Power BI, but I don't know anything about the data. I let them deal with it. I just manage the data source and I manage the infrastructure from an IT side of it. And so that makes it challenging when you try and go in and help them because the team that you're interacting with, they're not the business and, and or they're saying, look, the business doesn't even know how to do that necessarily. So we can't make changes to the data. And so that becomes, it's, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a struggle. So Marco, when I, I remember when I joined the cat team, I was so excited because I was like, Oh, my job's going to be so easy now because I'm working with the most strategic customers and <laughs> these guys are so smart. I'm just going to, you know, it's, I'm going to be talking about Power BI can't not that part, you know, that not that Power BI can't perform anything like that. It's just feature things. My very first, 
engagement on the cat team. I get on with them and I look at their data model, but it wasn't a data model. And I'm talking a big fortune. I mean, you know, big company. And big you company, go, yes. how, how did this happen? How did this happen? You know, so. Yes, sometimes they abandon it, but a lot of times we assume that these big companies have all the skills, you know, out there. They a lot of them don't, you know, a lot of them don't, and they don't follow the best practices. Or it's not in the right team, uh, yeah, to, yeah, to get the job done. Yeah, yeah, I think that many people like the same problem. I mean, probably we didn't clarify, but both Adam and Patrick work uh, in Microsoft. They are Microsoft employees, whereas day uh, job, That's the day I, job, yeah, it's the day job, of course, <laughs> the day job. Then the evening they do guy in a cube. But Alberto and I, we worked with Microsoft for many, many years, yes. but we are not employees. So our perspective outside of Microsoft, yes. oh, Microsoft Very is different. a big company. It's a big company. They, they always do everything right. They always think about every detail and so on. And 90% is true, but sometimes they miss something, right? That, like anyone. The, and bigger, bigger companies can do mistakes the same yes. way yes. as, as smaller companies. It yep. just, yeah. So... Um, but just coming back to the initial questions, when Alberto and I think about big data models, we think about more than Alberto, one or two billion rows, right? One, I think the, you can put the threshold around one billion rows. Yeah, because yeah, sure. You can make it slow even with a few millions rows, but you really need to do something dirty to do that. Well, I saw someone make billion. it really slow with eight million rows, and that was impressive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I tried with 125 million and I couldn't do it. So kudos yeah. to them. But but large companies usually have this data volume or they look for trouble when they are just at 10 or 100 million rows. In your experience. What, what was the question again? Alberto? Now the question is when, uh, when the companies, large companies, okay, large companies. Yeah call you there is a problem right you you are you're not called yeah, we don't, by these we don't companies. get the call we don't get the call where it's yeah. like man power bi is amazing thanks no. for everything you do no. those aren't the calls we get <laughs> no. it's, it's no. always people that is yes, that are it's, angry because that something doesn't work uh, not angry right? but they're yeah. they're frustrated or they've they've it's it's usually performance i don't know some of them are angry but some anyway. of them are angry. <laughs> <laughs> So, and those companies have uh, problems with, with what we think uh, is a big data model with one, two, ten more billion rows, or they are getting in trouble when they just have uh, 20 million rows, 100 million oh, rows. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely, yeah. Marco. Millions yeah. of rows. They, they get in trouble with millions of rows because they're still, they're not following any of the best, pra you know, design practices. You look at their DAX, it's materializing hundreds of millions of rows because they're doing a Cartesian product or something like yeah. that. So a lot of times it's just small baby data that they're, they get in trouble with. So one example I'll give you is, uh, um, and, and so when we say large customers that we're working with or we give customer examples, just know if we were to say the company name, you would absolutely know the brand. I'm like, these, yeah. are, these are big companies that are across the world and, and are very common. Um, the... Uh, one example was we got into something, it was performance, uh, and they were pulling it. We asked them, like, well, okay, how many how many rows are we working with here? Uh, 11 million. And I'm like, what the? And, okay, we're doing 100% direct query against SQL. And I'm like, okay, but still, 11 million rows is nothing. Like, what are you doing? And, oh, it's a view with, like, 40 joins underneath. And I'm like, backed by, like, <laughs> 500 you know, or like 5 billion rows behind the scene. I'm like, okay, now we're talking. And I'm like, yeah. why don't we just import that? Yeah. <laughs> and like, well, no, because, you know, we need to, we need to make sure it's up to date. Well, how, how often do you need to update it? Uh, twice a day. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> why don't we import it? <laughs> so so be before we move to the data query point, which is a very interesting yeah. one, I have, I just looking at the many questions, there is one question that is a, uh, related to what we were talking about, because we talk about billions of rows, but actually sometimes the problem is that we have just a few million rows uh, in a dimension, in dimension, right? And this yeah. is the question I, I got from YouTube channel where, yeah, we talk about billions of rows, but actually we could have a big issue when we have just a few million rows in a dimension, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that you also experience? Because 
for example, here Alberto and I have a lot of experience in customers, medium companies that struggle with this problem. Yep. So the the four billion row example I gave you, I think the dimension table there was around. Uh, I want to I want to throw out a thirty million row limit or thirty around thirty million rows. We'll say. Um, in that case, I, I think the approach they were taking was not to import that table because the dimensions typically are going to have a lot of strings, right? And so it's going to be higher cardinality. It's not going to compress as well. It's going to take a lot more space. Yeah. And they actually came up with an approach. I want to. I want to say this is true. Yeah, um, no, I know we had a discussion with it. Yeah. Well, well. So I, and I don't know if you're going to go with this, Patrick, but I, they were trying to do an ag. They were doing ags on the dimension itself. Yeah. So they had yeah. a smaller set of the dimensions at different yeah. grains yeah. to try and hit what they needed to do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So because what they wanted to do, they had you know this dimension table that had I don't remember how many rows in it. So we yeah. have our fact table, and it was imported, believe it or mm -hmm. not. And then we had our dimension table which was direct query. And I was able to, Kate, Phil has a term for the shadow, something. Oh, the shadow model. Yeah, shadow, yeah. shadow dimensions. And so I was able to put these ags at, uh, so let's say it was, let's say it's product, right? Like the adventure works, you got product, subcategory, category, things like that, color. And so the product was the grain, that was the 40 million. We put an ag at the subcategory, the category and the color, you know, that was imported. Mm -hmm. So you can dynamically use that in your slices and filters. But yep. then if they went down to the grain, they would hit direct query and they wouldn't have to import that 50 million row table. Now, yep. Mar Marco, Alberto, it's possible to get that 50 million row table in. And people don't think about you can actually use incremental refresh on a dimension table with yep. if you have some type of, you know, time intelligence or date or something on it. And or you just have some partitioning also. You can do right, that. And then you can process it and then you can use the... I forget the property on incremental refresh where I wrote a little pattern where it can intelligently yeah. refresh, you know, those partitions. So there's the ways pulling, to do it. The polling was a pulling yeah, the polling expression. Yeah, the polling, polling expression. expression. Yeah. 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 So but going back to the question, because I still see it on the screen. Yeah, I was I'm just wondering uh, <laughs> if uh, if you have a dimension with 40 million rows uh, and That's a fact one. table with 50 million rows, uh, why do you call it the one dimension and the other one the fact table? Oh, it's ooh. basically the same table. Oh, that's Even a good though point. this is totally against my latest article, just join them in one fat table and that's it. Well, okay. What if what if we've got like a hundred string columns on the dimension table? Do we want all of that on? But look um, at the numbers. I mean, no, we're no, talking about it's close. 40 million, they're, they're pretty like close. Million, so. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what but from from the dimension though. Like I don't know what's duplicated. I don't know what's not. So I, I would say it depends, but yeah, it's course. something so, to look at. It's something to look at. I, I think if we look at a question, the question is about how to fit in memory in memory both the dimension and the fact yes. table. And I think that the problem is what um, Adam said at the beginning. We have many strings. We have a lot of space that is required to store data in a not compressed way because unfortunately. Yes. The dictionary, which is the list of the unique values you have, is not compressed once yeah. it is in memory. Whereas the data is compressed, but the data can be compressed only if you have multiple times the same value in each column. And here is where we have a number of techniques to import only the data that you actually need to do, you know, to browse the data and to keep maybe in direct query the data that you want to use to drill through and to analyze the data at a detail level. That's now, right. the problem is that if you have actually, imagine another scenario, so let me remove this, another scenario where we have maybe 2 billion rows and 20 million customers, right? Could happen. At this point, you have a problem, which is that the granularity of the customer is very high and slow down any query that group yes. by a customer attribute, which could have just, you know, the state or the country. And so at that point, the technique is uh, to create another dimension with just a smaller number of uh, rows, which group customers by, for example, country or state or something like that, and you improve the performance because you can, instead of trying to aggregate the data, is actually just a very good optimization for data imported in memory, try to reduce the size of the dimension in terms of number of rows. This creates a problem, and we discussed that in the book, in some videos and in some article, but actually yeah. these are techniques that are, I think, necessary when you have at least two 
or maybe four million rows in a dimension, depending on the hardware. Four imported data. Yeah. So the other thing I'll, I'll add to that question that was out there um, when we're talking about the the one thing I'm keying off of here, and I, I saw some comments on the YouTube side of the uh, the the skew of AS that they were trying because it was an S1, which is yes, which yes. is a, which is a baby skew. Yeah. Um, the if you want to get and we see this on the premium side too. It's like, look, we want to get the most out of it that we can with the least amount of memory footprint. And if that's the case, the strategy at some point you're going to bump up against physics, right? You're just it's just not going to fit. And if you want to avoid having to go to the next skew for cost reasons, then you got to get creative and figure out how do I reduce. Um, or increase the grain of the data so I can get that summary table in memory and then maybe kick it back to direct query for the for the actual details and understanding that's going to be slower if we hit it. And you can do that with analysis services. It's, it's not the actual aggregation feature in um, in Power BI, so you have to kind of customize it a little bit. Phil Seamarks, Alex is, or yeah, Alex has dropped uh, Phil Seamarks aggregation blog series in the chat and he's got some awesome approaches, horizontal ags, filtered ags, those things are all things you can play with and do some switching from a DAX perspective yeah. to, to know where your boundaries are. So there is a always because it is related to what we discussed. Yes. When you import data, yes, uh, removing the strings could be an idea. So removing the string to integers, but actually the, this solves the problem only for the, the key column. If you have other attributes, the thing is that you have well, uh, maybe, Maybe I actually have an example where that's not the case. <laughs> Come on. Well, uh, so in terms of yes, in terms of converting it to an integer, the the balance on that I actually just had this where they created a composite key um, yeah. for for the aggregate table, and that's where we got like a, a, the biggest uh, gain that we had was because that one column it was a string column, and yeah. the dictionary on that column was like larger than the actual data. So yes, converting that to an integer gets rid of the dictionary and massively yeah. reduces it. In the in the case of the that example, though, I told him, can you just get rid of that column altogether? Like, do we even need it? Yep. So yeah, I mean, this could be <clears throat> a, a solution, but you have to understand where you are spending uh, memory right. yeah. using VertiPack Analyzer, yes. Index Studio, or in other tools. Uh, provides you exactly exactly the 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 analysis or where you are spending more memory. If you realize that you have many columns and this cost is spread across many columns, this will solve the problem only for one of those columns, which is the more important one probably, but you still have to consider the others. And so this yeah. is something you have to. I, one, to so one thing I'll, I'll I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, advertise your book here. Uh, so this book, if you don't have it at the back of the book around page yes. 560, 70 or so, uh, there's a whole chapter on how the VertiPak engine works, yes. how processing works. And there's other information in here about how the compression algorithms work. Not not in detail, but enough for you to understand the concepts of what's going on. Hash value or hash encoding versus value encoding, how that relates to processing size and how that relates to the data structures that you have. I, I cannot stress how important that for the stuff that we do at the big data scale understanding those key concepts of how the engine actually works helps you with debugging and yeah. where do you get the benefit uh, of how you can make this go further. Anyone doing big data needs to have that book. If they yep. don't have that book, they're not doing big data. Bottom line. And, <laughs> and this book. And a star schema. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. If you're not doing big data no. and you, you yeah. I, I found another another comment. St we are still talking about yeah, dimensions and <laughs> uh, this is interesting because this this question is about what happens if I have many you know sentences in a text phrases in a dimension. <sighs> I actually have seen this <sighs> in problem where imagine you have <sighs> the list of book names on Amazon or yeah. a, a website like that, uh, and you want to do a full search or movies. You have movies you want to search uh -huh. uh, with. Uh, it's a problem because yeah. for several reasons. First, because the, the the dimension in memory is very large, and the functions in DAX that you use to do the text search are, are not that fast. Yes. We don't have indexes. We don't have a full text search that works well. We don't have regular expression too. But besides, the real problem is the performance. And I have seen some customers starting to explore the idea of keeping in direct query the dimension while they have the fact table in memory. 
So it sounds crazy, but there are a few border cases, you know, a few side cases where this could be an advantage. I don't, I will, I don't think it's a good idea in general, but for this specific case, like you have to do this kind of search, maybe that you could find some... What, what would yep. be your thoughts, Marco, in that case? If we wanted, if we were thinking, oh, dimension, leave that in direct query. What about, uh, in, I, I know this depends on the, uh, the structure of the dimension, but if there were interesting enough attributes where we could leave off that full text string off of the main dimension and have a snowflake to the dimension that has the full text string, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? And leave that, leave that one in direct the, query. The biggest issue in this approach is how many, if you're selecting books, how many, how many books do we get as a result yes. of the, your selection. Because if you get 10, 100 books or videos or movies, whatever, is fine. The problem is when you get back a list of 1 million rows, because at that point, even though you have just integers, you have to move a few megabytes of data from uh, one storage to another. And then you have to use this list uncompressed yep. to apply a filter over yeah, compressed yeah. data that you, it's slow. It, it takes seconds <clears throat> and seconds if you're yeah. lucky, otherwise more. So for this reason, yeah. I, I would say it depends, right? If, yeah. if you have, if you know that you just want to get the f a small number out of the dimension, it could be an idea. But at that point, well, the other thing every... too, the other thing with that too, <laughs> another way, reason where that may be beneficial is what are you actually reporting on? And if the main piece of what you're reporting is at the summary level, you don't even need it, right? And it's like only if you go into this detail area where maybe you have that, you know, 50 to 100 results, and then, yeah, you're going to hit that. You know it'll be slower. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, it depends, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and so also some insights, and I'm sure, Margo, you and Alberto do this as well, but, like, when we get into customer situations, like Patrick and I, I know Alex and I have done this, we, and other folks, uh, Casper is another one where we do this, we just sit there and we have this discussion, like, and just brainstorming, like, okay, what are some, based on what we know, what, what are some things we can think of that we can try? And a lot of it is, let's try it. Let's compare the results and see what wins that we get. Yeah. Oh, that didn't pan out. Let's go try something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So moving, otherwise we, we talk only about large. I know. <laughs> large I Chinese. can go for hours on this, but. <laughs> yes. Uh, but because we touched the point, right? Direct query. We, we, we just introduced the topic just because we started talking about, oh, we could have the data outside, but. Going back to the main uh, title of today's uh, session, when and how often direct query is the problem? So how often you see that people are struggling with problems, performance issues with direct query, and what is the common solution to this besides <sighs> input the data? <laughs> all the time, all the time. I mean, it's not- All the time. When they get to us, if they're having, you know, when, by the time they reach us and it's direct query, it's they're having problems, you know. And so every time I talk to someone, regardless of the the back end, the storage engine, right, it could be SQL, it could be Snowflake, it could be BigQuery, it could be Redshift, doesn't matter. By the time it gets to us, they're having some type of problem with direct query. And the funny thing is, you'll go, they go, well, Power BI is slow. And I go, it's not Power BI, guys. It's not Power BI. And they go, oh, it's absolutely Power BI. And I go, open up Performance Analyzer look at the query, let's get the SQL, run it. Oh, it took 45 seconds to return that query. I told you it wasn't Power BI, you know? And so it's always, whenever they get to us, it's I, direct query, I, it's slow. I will I will caveat that with auto-generated T-SQL is always the best T-SQL. Yeah, absolutely, it's the best. It's the yes. only T-SQL you should use, <laughs> auto-generated. <laughs> <laughs> so, Are you kidding me? Yeah, but, but a lot of times though too is that it comes down to the the data structure, right? So even though we're, we're talking about, you know, modeling and Power BI, that applies to your data warehouse as well, because yeah. if it's structured in some weird way that you're, because you're complicating the data structure, that's going to end up in complicated DAX, which is going to, in a direct query situation, could result in weird complicated joins that have to happen on that end, which slows everything down. So how do you so, fix it, Marco? A composite model. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Alberto. No, the, the, the next question, the natural question at that point was uh, how often people use direct query even though they should not. So they have no reason at all to use direct query. <laughs> all the they time. could live in import mode, <laughs> but they use direct query for whatever reason. 
So uh, this, I have this going right now. I have one customer and the, it's, I think, I, I do think it's valid. I already have a repository of my data, right? I'm spending a ton of money and a ton of time loading this data warehouse that everybody's saying I need. So now you're telling me I need to take that data and move it again into this model when I have this direct query feature that I should be able to query. I get it, you know, and I, that's something I'm dealing with right now because I think it's a valid, a valid point that they're making. Why do I need to keep my data in two places? That's not fair, right? That's not fair because I already have it over here, you know. Um, but, but, right? The the other scenario is. A lot of times they do direct query and then I go in and say, how often did you load your data warehouse? They go once a day, but we need the freshest data, Patrick. I go, but it only loads <laughs> once a day. So <laughs> why are you doing direct think, query? You know, I think okay, so, so let me let me introduce a question I have seen, which is uh, tell me your records, which query I need to use direct query or import. So uh, it, I start, depends. I start, it depends, but it depends. <laughs> the general idea is that direct query. So probably it has the wrong name. Let's call it um, no cash. Okay. If you see no okay. cash, oh no, 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 no. Stay away. I want cash. <laughs> I want cash. Yeah. I want cash, right? I want the cash. Wait, want... That kind of cash or no, no different, different. Cash. <laughs> I want, because in that case, import... I do want the cash. <laughs> yes, I know. Sorry. <laughs> Missing in yes. translations. But yes. <laughs> when I when I have the data in import mode, actually the import mode can be seen. Yes, it's a copy of the data, but it's also a sort of cache of the data that I have in memory. Yeah. So if I call one cache mode and the other no cache mode, everybody would say, oh, no, 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 I want the cache mode, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the point. So yeah, it's not a size. Yes, there are two cases, I think, where direct query could be easily cho ch uh, chosen. One is that I have so much data, I cannot import in memory, right? We talk That's about right. 100 billion rows. If you have 100 billion rows and you need that kind of granularity, no matter what, okay, you have to stay in direct query. But if you have uh, 1,000 rows, probably you can use direct query too because it's so, there is no difference, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Query, what about yeah. 10 millions? Because that was the question. That's the point. Mm -hmm. 10 million rows, usually I import the data, no brain. I mean, everything yeah. that is in the middle, I try to import. And yeah. if, I fa if I have a problem with the import, then I start to say, okay, let's see if direct query could be an option. Yep. But to me, I, I never, I never start assuming that direct query is an option. Direct query nope. is no, know, never, the last resort, right? Yeah. The, 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 the thing I'm seeing with, with a bunch of enterprise customers though, too, is there's a lot of scrutiny on uh, compliance and regulation, uh, especially in certain customer segments. So if we think about financial sector, healthcare, uh, government, things of those natures where they're like, look, we need to e either one, we're cloud averse. And so we've got to keep the data on prem. And so we don't want to import data or two, a lot of times they're also, a lot of customers are spending a lot of money to host this large amount of data. Um, so whether we're talking about Synapse, Snowflake, SAP HANA, any of these infrastructures are very costly and they want to keep costs down. And then the flip side of that also is I want to use the thing I'm paying for. Yeah. And so I want to leave it in direct query. I've heard that a bunch of times as well. So there, there's there's different reasons why customers are coming in saying, I need to use direct query. And then it's an education standpoint on our end to understand that, look, yes, that's fine, but here are the pros and cons. And here's the things that you need to do to get your data even remotely ready for direct query. Because right now it's not. So Marco, but this, this I, that, go I ahead. Always try, yeah. I always try to, to do simple examples, and I think uh, direct query or import mode is, uh, or data, at my age, is like glasses. I mean, I have one pair of glasses, but that's not enough. I need two pairs, uh, one for near and one for far. That's it. I, I so buy you, have your, you have your data, your data warehouse that works fine. That's fine. But you also need another set of data, which is uh, the glasses for near, and you use it for a different purpose. It wouldn't work if I use the wrong glasses. I just cannot see it. That's, it. Ah, that's great. That's great. But I think whenever people start talking about direct query, it's a negotiation, especially if the data is being frequently updated. You know, yeah. it's not, we're not talking about 
data warehouse data. I, you know, if I have 10 million rows, it's in some repository, let's go with the cash. There's no discussion. There's no negotiation. Yeah. There's no discussion. But when we're talking about, you know, highly data that updates really frequently, you, I, you know, I don't just give in to the end user and say, we're just going to direct query. No, that, 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 no, maybe we can come up with some negotiation that says, OK, I can't give you real time because nobody really not. There's very few scenarios where we require true real time. It's a negotiation. Say, you know what? Maybe I can do some refreshes three times a day, four times a day, five times a day so I can get yeah. it cashed up. You know, so I don't know. I, I think as as data modelers, we kind of give in to our report consumers or whoever's, you know, the the end users too quickly and say, OK, you can have direct query. And then we we're up at night trying to figure out how do I make this faster? How do I make this faster? When you just kind of, you know, get a spine and say, look, you can't have direct query. We're going to come up with something better. So anyway, I, I put this uh, question because it was related. It, it clearly direct query performance depends on the data source and the best uh performance you have on uh, the remote data source the better and of course for the kind of queries we do which are mainly aggregating of large amount of data having the column store index on SQL server uh, or another columnar storage for the relational database can help even though please don't expect they to be faster than importing data so the the if no you way. need a reference in terms of performance import data anything else slower this is the right expectation right this is not uh, it's assuming that oh I, I go to whatever the name because it is much faster no it will be slower because at a certain point you have to move the data between two different servers and depending on the queries the data is not complete you, you don't get the result of the query you get a partial result that has to be you know merged by the formal engine in the tabular engine and this takes time and overall you slow down the performance so it's a good idea, of course. This is a good idea, but again, remember the the right expectation. I don't know if you have something to add on this. Uh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I don't have. You're right. But then I just want to follow up on um, Patrick. Yep. I think a lot of people use direct query with very large table because they want real time and they also have a multi billion tables. Yeah. Yeah. But this goes back to the question: if you have billions of rows, so you have like 10 years of data. Now, why on earth do you need real time? Because real time is for comparing yesterday with today or a week ago, not comparing what happened at 9 a.m. 10 years ago with what is happening right now. So either you have a lot of data and then you go for import because you pre-aggregate, or you have a very small data set that need to be updated very frequently. So you need to make a choice. Either you have a lot of data or you have real time. There's no point in trying to accomplish both at the same time. It's, it's going to be a failure. Yeah, yeah. agree, agree. When, agree. And so some of that comes back to understanding what is it you're reporting on. And also, if there's separation between the folks building it and the people using it, go talk to your people, please, please and find out what they're reporting on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Instead of just designing for that worst case scenario, which is like I'm like, okay, well, in that, ugh, yeah, don't don't do that. Talk to your people. Talk to your I, people. That that's a, you know, to continue the conversation about this topic. That's interesting. This is an interesting co um, question because uh, again, so what's your? I mean, I already have an idea, but this time I want to hear your your feedback first. So if you have a data warehouse that updates every five, every five minutes. minutes would you use a direct query or import for this type of scenario? Yes. It would be a composite model. <laughs> yes, it's a composite. good thing. Well, it would be a composite maybe, model. maybe. Uh, so like, this is where I start looking at like Phil's blog on filtered ags. Yeah. Right. A, so like if I've got a small window, like maybe the last, you know, hour or 24 hours, leave that in DQ. And then the rest of it, I can import or cache, you know, and partition it in certain ways and play around and get creative with it, right? So are there ways that we can accomplish some things of that nature that that satisfy the business requirement, but still give us flexibility on how we're working with the data? But, but before we go to that level of complexity, yes, 
which Adam is complex. Just, it's Adam you, just you need, said this. Yeah. He just said this. Go talk to your people. He, just because I'm loading data every five minutes, that doesn't necessarily they mean they need to read data every five yes. minutes. You know what I mean? Yes. And so I get it, yeah. right? I, I built a data warehouse like this back in a long time ago, almost 20 years ago now, uh, wow. that was capturing data every minute from these web servers off of billboards. And we went and talked to the consumers and they said, oh, no, we're just going to look at this like every hour, every two hours, just because you're writing it every five minutes. That doesn't mean we need it every five minutes. So, yes, you can go do these complex filtered ags and all this kind of stuff. But the first thing you need to do before you get into those complexities is get out of your seat, IT people, and go talk to the people that's going to consume these reports because maybe they don't need it to refresh that fast. So that's uh, nice. I, I would add one thing, <laughs> which is... Uh, <laughs> I, I would add one Don't thing. Don't hear that every phone. day. <laughs> I would add one thing, which is uh, if you have a data warehouse that updates data every five minutes, I'm pretty sure there is a lot of code behind that, right? There yes. is some developer doing something, database mm -hmm. developer. Or... Now, spend a little bit of the time of these developers and using analysis services or XML endpoint in Power BI use incremental refresh if you yes. have the new data in five minutes you can just mm. add the rows to an existing yes. partition it will take yes. a fraction of the time for the full refresh yep. and you have pretty much the same uh, updates that you have in uh, the data warehouse and you will have the performance of importing mode so mm. the only price to pay is a, a latency of maybe two or three minutes the time to transfer the data to add the rows and to complete the mm -hmm. refresh. But if you optimize yeah. that part, and of course, to, there is no wizard to do that. That's the problem. You have to take the books <laughs> and look at some example of how to write in maybe PowerShell or mm -hmm. uh, because you can do the PowerShell uh, script doing that. Yes. And so without having to code everything in C Sharp or other languages, you could write in PowerShell a script that you can schedule on an Azure function. And so with a minimal amount of code, so it's, it is not no code, but it's really a minimal amount of code. If you understand how this architecture works, there is a way to do that already. And it, it I mean, it worked for many, many years, but now in Power BI, because we have the XML endpoint, we can use the same feature we used for analysis services for uh, many, many years. So, really? so one thing, uh, it's, it, it just brought something to mind that I've been, I've been noticing as well is there are um, people, it, it's almost like there's two different sets of folks, folks that have been working with analysis services for a long time. And now we've got Power BI is, is big enough to where people are used to working with Power BI desktop. They're, wor they're used to working with the GUI and they're like, okay, well, I'm working with this big data how do I actually get that? Like incremental refresh isn't working for me. How do I, how do I get this approach on this through Power BI Desktop? And I'm like, look, at this scale, like if those, if the GUI dialogues and stuff aren't working for you, you are entering into a pro dev model at this point, and you've got to use those tools to get the complexity that you need to work with that scale of data. Uh, if you can do it in in Power BI Desktop and just using those, more power to you. That's great. Uh, but at some level, you're going to have to use a tool like Tabular Editor. You're going to have to use tools like DAX Studio to get to that level and have to write some scripting and, and possibly integration with ETL processes, things of that nature. Uh, and I've, I've heard people trying to avoid that specifically. And I'm like, oh. You got to roll your sleeves up, man. You got to roll yeah. your sleeves up. Yeah. 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 So just to cover, you know, also other topics, uh, I think that sometimes the problem is, okay, we, we talked about the different storage we have, direct query and uh, vertibug, import mode. We talked about the dimensions and the data modeling in general. Uh, can we add something more, keeping the data model and then we will move out to the reporting area, but staying on the data model for a, a few other minutes. What about problems in relationships? So how, how often do you see that the problem is that it's always related to the data model, but when the relationship, uh, an improper use of the relationships is causing a big issue in big data models, in your experience. We, we just went 
through this with one customer. Go, go ahead, Patrick. It's not it's not as common as, you know, direct query, poor data modeling. It's not as common as those things, but we, we see those. Yeah, we see those. We see scenarios yeah. like that where it's ladled with bi-directional, you know, relationships and then there's ambiguity and things like that. We see tons of that. We see, I, I've seen one where they had this relationship and there were so many violations of the keys. They just didn't exist, you know? So they but it's not as common, though. I I, I don't know. Go ahead, Alex. I, it, I, I, don't know. I mean, it depends. Uh, yeah. They uh, it, again, this comes down to people when you try to overcomplicate your model, you end yeah. up in wacky situations, especially with relationships where you start introducing bidirectional. You maybe have some approaches where you're like, oh well, I need an inactive relationship to avoid some circular reference. I'm like, okay, well, you, the way you did that, we can just avoid that altogether with a direct relationship to get your other thing to work. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's just, it, to me, it's the relationship issues usually crop up when the model is overcomplicated because of the fact they're not, either they're working with a data warehouse that they don't have direct control over and they're compensating, or they just didn't really spend time to really model their data. Yeah. And sometimes they just don't know. You know, because I, yeah, I saw one yeah, a lot. one model. They had eight fact. They had one one. You know, the fact table, but they had eight date tables, and they had a date table for each of the dates on the fact table. And it's like, what are you doing? Why do you have that? You know, when they could just have one date table and do some role playing with inactive relationships. So yeah. they just, I, I think, some a lot of times they don't know. They just don't know. So I, I have an interesting question because it's related to the to the relationship topic, which is uh, we I'm importing two tables, dimension and fact, and uh, referential integrity violation exists between them, which means for those that don't know, there is some value in the fact table that references a value in the dimension that doesn't exist. And this generates what is called a referential integrity violation, which is not the real error, is 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 a normal condition of a tabular a database, but it's something that could be uh, more expensive for for the query. So the question is: the full DIM table is being scanned for every query. How can fixing the violation optimize the internal query? Fix the violations. Fix the Patrick's, violations. Pat, Patrick's got a video on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fix, the, fix the violations. Fix it. I mean, why would you have values in your fact table that don't exist in the dimension? I don't. I fix it. I don't. I don't know how, what else to do with that. But you got to go fix the violations. Yeah, but Alberto, I, I, to me, it seems strange that we have this kind of. I mean, it doesn't change. Why this should change in in an important table? I, I understand for a you know a mixed query. model or a composite model. In an import table, I don't. I don't think is a is an issue by itself. Yeah, I mean uh, it's. To me, it's not clear what it means that yep. uh, the dimension is being scanned for every query. Yeah. Because yeah. actually, you cannot check uh, what the engine did uh, yeah. at that level. Probably there is a, there is a scan of the table, but uh, so so I would also go back there too and say like, well, you're seeing it's being scanned. Like, if you could see that, I'm like, are you seeing a performance problem? Like, because yeah, if you're not seeing thing. a performance problem, why do we care? Yeah, yeah. Like, usually, I mean, usually th there are again there are. Side conditions where this could be, but but not in a simple query as uh, the one that we are discussing. Yeah, but so, I think Marco, yeah. in general, uh, just a few seconds ago, you said that uh, a, a reference integrity violation is not a problem; it's just a regular state for a tabular model. I would not say that at all. So, to me, a reference integrity violation is a huge problem. So, if you okay. have it. That's a serious flaw in your data model because uh, you have data that cannot be distinguished in any way uh, unless you you go and look at uh, different values for the keys. So if you have uh, a single reference integrity violation, your model is flawed. There is a problem somewhere and you need to fix that. Then Tabula might be nice enough to work with that uh, and show some number, but uh, but referential integrity should be maintained at all costs. And yes. that should be considered by everybody as, as a big problem. Yep. I bet you there, I bet you it's some type of big data system that doesn't enforce referential integrity, doesn't allow foreign key constraints on it, and somebody's loading it, and they're not, you know, there's no check. There's no checks to validate the relationships in the data source. Yep. Just and... based on what you said a few seconds ago, Patrick, I would just 
try to plot if there is a correlation between uh, the word problem, Power BI, and big data in the same sentence. Uh, and it uh, looks like. <laughs> Just before before moving to the to the report inside of the of the problem with big data models, I have another question that is a little bit in you know, it, it look oh, at the problem from another perspective because uh, the first question to Patrick and Adam is how often these days you have large models imported with this kind of problems to columns that have a large amount of data because uh, in this case we are talking about a column that has a very large cardinality for a double or floating point mm -hmm. value and what could what could be the the, the optimization now the, the specific optimization mentioned mentioned here could be not a good idea for it, it depends yeah, yeah it depends usual, as but, usual but it's but, dangerous yeah. it's very dangerous it's dangerous yeah. So, but before we before we answer to the question and specifically providing some some direction, what is your experience in general about this kind of lots, problems? Lots, lots, lots really? this, Wait, this is a common thing. This is a common thing. And well, so I, I would say in, I mean, it's common in the sense that we do see models with that. Um, yeah. it, I would say that the answers to that questions are varied. Yeah. So, in terms of and what's so, done about it. The first yeah. thing, and so I don't know if you guys have noticed the trend, but let's go talk to the people that's consuming the report <laughs> and see how many decimal places they really need. Yeah. You know, do I really need to keep this as a double? That's the very first thing I'll say, right? Because the more decimal places, it's likely the higher cardinality, the larger the data set. And so the first thing I'll say is, hey, let's go talk to them. Do they need eight decimal places? Maybe they only need four. You know, we can reduce the cardinality. I, I try to be as l less destructive as I possibly yep. can. Splitting, mm -hmm. splitting that value into two, man, that is a dangerous thing. And if I need to do that, then I'll get down to that path. But the, the path of least resistance is the path that I try to take most of the time. And that's just talking to them and say, hey, do you need this? And nine times out of 10, you know what people come back and say? Oh, well, I so, don't need it at, at that I level of... Uh, yeah, you know, I just I, I'm in in the swings right now with a customer where uh, we saw the fact table had maybe 20, 30 columns on it. Uh, this one table and it was an ag table trying to get it into into memory. Uh, it's around 60 gigs. Um, and one of the things we had were they had doubles on everything, uh, including quantity columns. Uh, and I'm like, do we need double? Do, do you need do you need the what what are the decimals? Can we change it to currency? instead of mm -hmm. instead of a double can we get a fixed decimal can we get and they even said like doing that they said oh my gosh that actually yeah. helped a lot in their model and they found like no we talked to the business and they said they only need the two decimals so we're good we yeah. we we went from a decimal to a whole number on one and i'm not kidding you the model went from 6 gigs to 1 gig from six to one. Now, it wasn't just one column, it was several columns that we did that for, but changing the precision. And, I, and people don't think about that. People just don't, they just assume we need that level of precision. Sometimes changing the precision can help drastically reduce yeah. it. Going to the that's split, a... going to the split yeah. is the last thing I think about. You guys have an article the, that's what, back in 2000? Yeah, I, and I wanted yeah. to clarify because uh, those articles where we describe the split as an option, uh, is because we want to explain the concept behind. But to be honest, they are very effective in small data models. If you have, for example, you have uh, one, two million of unique values in a table with five, 10 million rows, it's effective. Splitting the value in two values is effective. But is, it, it should be a, an optimization that you do on small models, especially in Power BI desktop, because you want to squeeze the memory the, the smaller you want. And you already made the other optimization, which is reducing the precision. However, when you have one billion rows, uh, the problem is that if you create two columns instead of one, summing the total of the two columns is more expensive. Usually it's more expensive because at that point you will lose the saving that you have in the dictionary because you are increasing the size of the data sites, the compressed data. And the compressed data is what matters when you run the query, not the dictionary size. So at the end, in a very large data models, splitting the column is not really a good idea. The priority in every model is trying to reduce the precision, the number of unique values you have. For small models, 
you could split the column to further reduce the memory, which could be an advantage, especially when you use Power BI Pro and Power BI Desktop, because you, you have a limit in the size of the model that you can send to the service. Okay, so now, changing the topic, because we're going uh, close to the hour, but reports, right? <sighs> reports. Uh, what is the... What could go wrong there? What, you, you have this big data model, we optimized everything. What is the common issue that you see when, you know, in the last mile? <laughs> you, might, you want me to start there, Patrick? Yeah, go ahead, go for right. it, go so, for it. So the common thing I see is customers just, they, it's 100% direct query, and we throw like 20 visuals on the canvas and then wonder what the heck's going on. Um, and it, it's, it's because of the fact that when we're in that direct query model, what people don't understand and usually is a revelation because they think about concurrency and they think, oh, well, we've got a hundred users. And so that's going to be a hundred queries on the back end if we're, if we're doing concurrent, uh, that's not actually what happens. So each visual, uh, is going to introduce one or more queries to your data source, uh, depending on the complexity of what needs to happen, that visual could issue multiple queries because of how data movement needs to happen and what the engine needs to do to compute calculations. And as a result of that, you just introduced a ton of queries to your backend data source and you know multiply that by the number of users, that's your query patterns, and that data source needs to respond um, and usually sub-second. Uh, so it's, it's painful. Um, and there are techniques to avoid that, but I, now we've also seen models where you know, they've got 20, 30 visuals on the canvas and you look at performance analyzer, it's imported and the DAX is returning sub-second. It's all fast. Uh, and, you know, the the glorious category that is consuming time is other, right? And so then we, you know, like, what the heck is other? And so you need to start thinking about how many visuals we're using. Can we get, uh, can we be creative on how we're actually doing that? And then you have to start tinkering uh, in terms of what you need to do. So... To add to that, the thing, one thing that I think when it comes to Power BI is great, right? It's ad hoc, you can drag and drop. But a lot of, a, a, a common thing that we see is people drop a table or a matrix and just start adding everything to that table and matrix. Then they go, but I can't export it all, right? While Power BI is great for ad hoc analysis and great visualization tool, you got to pick the right tool for the job, especially when it comes to big data. And Chris Finland's going to love me for saying this. He's going <laughs> to love me for what I'm about to say. <laughs> But sometimes you should not use a paginator. I mean, a Power BI report, you should absolutely use a paginator report, especially if you're trying to see, you know, and I have no idea why people want to see millions and millions of rows of data. But if they're trying to see tens of thousands of rows of data, don't use a matrix, don't use a table. It'll work. I mean, it can work. But think about the right tool for the job. And sometimes paginator reports is the tool when you're looking at lots and lots of data. So, and Patrick, you were, this was, I think, yesterday. You were showing me a VPAX file. I'm like, let me see the VPAX. And, and we looked at it and you're like, oh, it's going. And I looked at the results and I'm like, dude, your DAX is fine. It's DAX it's the fine. rendering. Your rendering took like, you yep. know, it was like three seconds on a render of one visual. And I'm like, what's one. that visual? Yeah. I don't know. We got to go figure that out. We it's probably, some, that. I, I guarantee it's probably a wacky matrix visual. Yeah. I'm just going to say, yeah. or a custom visual. It could be or a, a custom visual. Some yeah. custom visual yeah. that's yeah. causing a problem. My visual. Yeah. Yep. I have a now is is not really there. I understand that for the report the number of visuals is the more yeah. important thing. But how often? Because when you talk about the visual, you talk about the number of queries that run over the server. And when you have a large customer, this could create a scalability problem, right? The the number of concurrent users could be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in some ways related to this, because uh, if you import the data, what happens is that you have a finite amount of resources on the server, right? So you have a slow DAX query creates a problem for one user, but it creates a large number of problems if you have many users. I so the query that optimizing the DAX query is, so the question is about, should I pre-aggregate the data? If you already fixed everything else, yes. But believe me, you need to fix everything else uh, before uh, needing pre-aggregating the data in import mode. Because if you are using direct query, yes, you, you, you import the data, sorry, you create pre-aggregated data to avoid going on, uh, on the direct query side because you have data imported. I mean, uh, an aggregation is imported data. And 
So the idea is that you should optimize your DAX query before everything else, just optimizing the DAX code, right? Oh, because yes. this is the, the, the way you reduce the consumption, the CPU consumption on the server, and you obtain two advantages. First, a single user run a report, a single report faster. Two, when you have 100 users at the same time over the same report, it scales well because uh, you, uh, you, you, you reduce the amount of CPU used by, for, for mm -hmm. each query that can run at the same time on the server. So is yep. this something that you have seen too, the scalability issue for large customers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, Patrick, that's you had a... one specifically that was, that was very interesting. With the one yesterday? Yeah, that one too. The one yesterday, <laughs> we were talking about the DAX was fine. Honestly, we couldn't, and I, I was thinking about this a little more, Adam. I think they gave me cache results. I think they gave me cache results on the, mm. the perf data. I think it was cache. But mm. Marco, yes, you're absolutely correct. We see this probably once a week uh, <laughs> where people, wow. they're just not, Maybe, maybe we just, they, they're not thinking about it all the way through, right? They throw the DAX out and they go, oh, it's just going to work. And then you look at the spikes, you know, when a lot of people start hitting the model, when there's a high concurrent, high concurrency, a number of people hitting it and everything is bad. Then it just calms down when a few people are hitting, they go, oh, everything's fine now, but it's just poorly designed DAX. I see it a lot. I would say there was one time, Patrick, that we had this where it, it wasn't that. I think it was, it, there was a legitimate, like it was something on the back end that was oh, potentially. Oh, right? that's that was, what you're talking that's about. The only, that's the only time yeah. we've ever seen that. Uh, but not to say that it couldn't be like some actual infrastructure type issue, like not yeah. related to well, your model necessarily. Yes. But yes. that is extremely rare. Most people tend to think that's the problem, you know, because it's not their ugly baby. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it's the service. But uh, I've only I've only personally seen that one time. Yeah, that one. But Ever. Yeah. <laughs> Not to say once. it doesn't happen with other folks, but like for us personally, one time. But from a DAX perspective, though, I think we've seen it several times. I yeah. do. Yeah. 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 From the DAX. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's just bad DAX. That, so... well, that, and that's the ugly baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think we pretty much, I, I mean, we pretty much covered the, the, the many, many uh, ideas, many areas we wanted to talk about. Uh, probably we missed that. I have seen hundreds of questions yes. yeah. in the chat, and I think that it will be very interesting. So for those of you that didn't see the, the question uh, answer during the session, uh, we will take a look at the questions, and this could be I, these, these will be ideas for future articles or other webcasts or other videos. So certainly, if there is something interesting that we see, we will uh, take this as a good idea. Uh, is there something you want? We are at the hour, so we probably have to close the session. But yeah. is there something you you want to say to our? You are at our secret yeah. channel, so I, I I would say if we were smarter people. Um, and by, by we, I mean, me and Patrick, um, I, I would have, we would have followed this up with having you actually on the live stream tomorrow morning on yes. our channel. Yes. Um, yes. that would have been like a one, two punch of like, look, you got more questions. Come over here. We're just going to tag yeah. team. Uh, we, we did talk, talk about that at a larger scale of doing some sorts types of yeah, crossover, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, uh, if we were smarter, we would have actually planned that to the land, but not we did not. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually, uh, Patrick and Nada, I mean, we at Secret BI, we do these live events, uh, not on a regular schedule. Yep. Whereas uh, Adam and Patrick, every Saturday, more or less, they have a live chat, a uh, live Q&A that they run on the uh, Guy Saturday YouTube channel. Yep. Saturday morning. Saturday morning, center time, but it could be afternoon for Europe uh, yep. and night for other people. But we wow. see people from all around the world every time. I attend the chat session every yeah. time i can because it's Marco's too, a regular yeah, it's, yeah but it's too much of fun i mean it's, uh, it's very i, I enjoy yes. the you know I, vibe. I will actually extend if you guys are available tomorrow morning we can pull you in like that works for us it's up to yeah. you yeah. though I, we didn't necessarily advertise it or anything else but uh <laughs> you're, you're always welcome i i would be i would be there i would be there so okay. i would be there too yeah well, there right. you go, i'll, I'll there send you, you an email that's fine <laughs> let's do it <laughs> tomorrow okay, morning on the guy in the cube channel all four of us again all four okay. of us again tomorrow <laughs> and we will follow up the questions that we had today yes yes okay Excellent. so it had been a pleasure uh, yes. Thank you very, very much. For thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Right. And see you soon. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow morning. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>